Well, hi there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as always, on behalf of Alice, Mark, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on in our study in Paul's first letter to Timothy. Quite a letter. Yes, quite a letter. Quite a letter. Uh, and it's not just to Timothy, and that's the point. That's right. It was from Paul to Timothy and on to the church of the time and on to us. It is, after all, a living word, living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So this word is as vital, as alive today as it was when Paul put ink to the paper. To the paper. Um, we're going to start right after... Mark asks God's blessing on our time together, but I do want to remind you that we encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions you have, any suggestions, any comments. We just love to hear from you. So, brother? Lord, we just thank you that you're within our midst, and we ask you to bless this study and dig out our ears and open up our minds and hearts so that we can see better your word. Amen. Amen. The word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. Because the more we see, more clearly we see Jesus, the more we will be like Jesus. All right, as I said, we're continuing on in our study of 1 Timothy. We ended last week in, in the third chapter in the 15th verse, coming to the end of that chapter. And I, I just do want to read that verse again to kind of reconnect us to where we were. Mm -hmm. It says, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, we didn't get a lot into that last week. No. But what do you think it means to be a pillar and a buttress of the truth? Well, a pillar holds... A, same there. thing as a buttress. I mean, yeah. a buttress... Uh, they hold up the truth. Yeah. They they make sure that the first truth doesn't collapse. I mean, right. That's what you do right. with a pillar and a, and a buttress in in construction, all right? Support. And that is because of our common, the witness of our common confession, which is what Paul says next. By common confession, and the, the uh, King James says, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. Who, he who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Speaking, of course, of, of Jesus, right? Now, that certainly should be our common confession. Okay? That's a brief summary of his life. Well, yeah, he was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, mm -hmm. okay? Seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, still being proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. That should be our common confession. Our confession is supposed to be about Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, the question is, it should be our common confession, but, but is it? Do we have a common confession? And there's a lot to consider here with the word confession, right, when it comes to our confession. Mm -hmm. Certainly the things that are mentioned here by Paul should be common to and proclaimed by the church, the entire church, mm -hmm. the real church, the body of believers, right? But it's worthwhile to examine other things that Paul said concerning confession, Starting with, and I want to read you to, to you from Romans 10. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Uh-huh. Italian dynamite. Italian dynamite. I, TNT. Because there, Paul said that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's the importance of our confession. It's not enough to believe. You've got to confess it. You've got to tell others. You've got to speak it out, right? And, and a bit later on in this, in this letter to Timothy, mm -hmm. 
in 1 Timothy 6, 6, 12, and 13 are the verses. He said, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. So he's commending Timothy as he's writing to him that, he, that Timothy made the good confession. Yes. So the question is, and I've asked this you know, many times, what is the good confession? My father is in control. Well, that's exactly what he's referring to here when he says the good confession Jesus made that good confession before Pontius, Pontius Pilate. Pilate. Mm -hmm. What confession did Jesus make before Pontius Pilate? Bear in mind, he didn't say much in front of Pontius Pilate. No. Like, a, like a lamb right before mm -hmm. the slaughter. He just didn't say anything. Except for the fact that Pontius Pilate literally mm -hmm. represented all the power of the world at the time. He is there as the, the ambassador, the minister of, the, whatever you want to call it. He is the very presence of the Caesar of Rome. He represents all the power of Rome. And he's standing there with Jesus in front of him on trial. And he says to Jesus, because he's, he's I think he's, he's shocked. Astounded. He's yeah. astounded by the fact that here he is speaking to Jesus of this horrible death by crucifixion. He says, don't you know that I have the power to put you to death or give you life? And Jesus said, you'd have no authority except my Father in heaven gave it to you. That's right. What Jesus is saying is, my Father is in control. That's right. That, my brothers and sisters, good is confession. the good confession. No matter what is going on in your life, mm -hmm. your confession needs to be, no matter what it looks like, Amen. that your Father in heaven is in control of the situation. And he's made a promise to you. Yes. Because it says, again, back to Paul writing in Romans, and he said, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. Our confession is God's in charge, God's in control, and I have no fear. Okay. And that leads us to, when we have that confession as part of our life, let's move to the fourth chapter in the first and second verses. Mm -hmm. Because then Paul says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. In later times, some will fall away. Bear in mind, remember... Is that the something? great apostasy? Well, it is. Bear, I just want you to remember something. That when Paul was writing this, he didn't stop and change pages and change, start a new chapter. This, no, this the chapters is, and so forth have been added later on, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just a, an absolute continuation of what he's saying. So he's talking about that good confession, and talking about how we have to stand fast knowing that God is in control. But then he says, in, in the later times, in the last days, some are gonna, not going to do that. They're not going to confess that. They're not going to make that good confession. confession. They're going to fall away from the faith. And they'll do so by paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisies of liars seared in their own conscience, with a, as with a branding iron. In later times, some will fall away. Now, I know, I've seen revival. Mm -hmm. I don't have a great expectation of seeing this, this phenomenal revival that a lot of Christians are looking for in the last days. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see that the Bible attests to that. What I do see, and what I, you know, if Timothy doesn't get this this first time, he'll certainly get it because here's one of the places I see it. I see it when Tim, when Paul writes to Timothy again, in second letter to Timothy, in in chapter four verses two to four, Paul says to him, "Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season." Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come, and remember he's talking about the last days in that place in Second Timothy. For the time will come where they will not endure a sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. 
He's saying they're not going to hold on to it. They're not going to endure it. They're not going to put up with sound doctrine. You know, Jesus had warned his apostles as he spoke of those. They asked him. They came to him and said in Matthew 24. And they said, tell us, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age, right? And, and Jesus had warned them that many will fall away. And that most people's love will grow cold. It's all in Matthew 24. Go read that. And again, this is confirmed by Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. Because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul said, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So what, what Paul spoke of and what Jesus spoke of in the last days is this great apostasy. A f it's more than a falling away. Yeah. First of all, you can't lose your salvation. No, you have to give it up. I, I, I do agree with some people, but that doesn't mean, it does not mean that you can't choose to give it up. Mm -hmm. You can't choose to turn to Jesus and walk away from the truth, all right? Those who f are falling away choose to. Absolutely. And if, I don't even think falling away is the, the right term. Yeah. They're deserting him. Yeah, it's like John 666. Well, yeah, we're gonna, I want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Because they're deserting him. They're, they're turning away and turning their back on Christ and, and walking away. They're paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. They're not paying attention to the living word. They're paying attention to the false prophets. They're paying attention to the false teachers. They're paying attention to the deceitful and demonizing spirits who are behind them, right? Mm -hmm. They're listening to the world instead of listening to the Word. They're choosing to do that. You know, in Revelation 13, and you probably know this, it, it talks about the number of the beast, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Hear is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is... 666. 666. Mm -hmm. Now that John, the Apostle John, wrote that, given that by Jesus while he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos, mm -hmm. right? But consider this. I mean, like I said, you know, these the, the verse numbers and chapter numbers, there. they, they yeah. weren't there when this was written. Right. They were added later. It's very and I don't think anybody yeah. sat down and said, well, I want to make sure how this works right. out. They just numbered him. But interestingly, in John's Gospel, in the 6th chapter, in the 60th and 66th verses, I want to read that to you. Mm -hmm. It says, Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard statement. Who can listen to it? As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. John 666 result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They left Jesus because his word was difficult. They left Jesus because his words, which lead to life, when they heard this, it, 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 to them it was too hard. You can't, you can't believe this. It was too hard to pay attention but it was easy enough to pay attention to the deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons that lead to death. Mm. Why? Because they're listening to, remember what, what it said, the things they desire. They're accumulating for themselves teachers who will teach according to their own desires. I'm going to tell you something. God teaches according to his desire. And our great desire should be God's desire. Yes. Okay. Are you willing to hear the hard things or just the easy, pleasurable to the flesh things? Because they're both in the Word. I mean, there are New Testament promises. To buy. There are a lot of New Testament pro promises. You know, people love to hear about getting. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. People love to hear what you're going to get, what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said in Luke 14, 33, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. How often do you hear that? Right. These are promises in the New Testament, and not by not a complete list by any means, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
so all many. who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Mm -hmm. That's the word of God. Yes. You'll be hated by all because of his name's sake. Jesus it says that they hated Jesus. First, they're they going to hate you. Mm -hmm. The sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. We are called to die to ourselves. We're called to deny ourselves, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. Uh, well, I mean, because the word is full of that. That's part of the word of God. So many things that I promise you, you will not commonly hear in many, many, many churches. What you hear in the church should be our common confession. And our common confession are, is supposed to be those things that buttress up, hold up, and support the truth. Okay? Now, it, it's not, I'm not saying that everything in the Word is that difficult and that following Jesus is, is hard mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. There's but I times. am saying yeah, there are times. that there's, there's a difference between hearing a message that is nothing but sugar-coated gospel of mm. prosperity and happiness because that's not rightly balanced. Yeah. It's, not, it's not rightly divided. Okay? Mm -hmm. there, there, it, Jesus said, count the cost. You better understand that there is a cost following Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and you better be prepared to pay it. And it is a sign that we are living in the last days. I am sure that that message, that message of counting the cost to follow Jesus, that we are to deny ourselves and not care about ourselves, but care about others and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's not a message that's very common, yeah. particularly in the large, large churches, because if they preach that in the large, large churches, they, they might mean, not be large, large churches. Right. Because the flesh doesn't want to hear that. No. Okay? It doesn't tickle the ears. It hugs the heart mm. and buttresses up and supports the truth. So instead, when you hear, when, when these false teachings are going forth, these are people who, well, let me, the next verse, the next, 1 Timothy 4, 3 says, men who forbid marriage and advocates abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Right? Mm -hmm. So there are people out there who forbid marriage, tell you you got to stay away from certain foods, which God said, you know, God created to be gratefully shared in. Right? In Colossians 2... I'm going to read verses 20 and to 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. That's what all religion that's not pure and undefiled in the eyes of the, in the sight of the, mm -hmm. our God, and that's what James says, James 127, right? That's what man-made religion is all about. It's either too easy Oh, just eat the fruit and there you go. You'll be like God. <laughs> well, they make it extremely hard, make it extremely difficult, you know, by, by all these rules that you only get right with God or achieve that worthiness to go to heaven based on your hard works. Yeah. And neither of those is true. Yeah. They're both out of balance. Either, you know, I, Jesus said that the way to life is narrow and straight and narrow, Right? Exactly how narrow is it? Well, think tightrope. <laughs> I was, was going to say, yeah. Think tightrope. Because Satan wants you on that wide, easy path that leads to destruction. So he doesn't care if you fall off to the left or fall off to the right. He just wants you off the narrow, straight and narrow path. So he tries to get you off that path, all right? So on the one side, he'll try, he'll, he has a, a false message on this side, if that works for you. If not, he's got a false message for you on this side. But either way, he's trying to distract you or take you away 
from the simple truth of God's word. Salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I grew up in a religion that told, told certain classes of people, if you want to minister, you can't be married. Told you, you know, on this day you can't eat this or you can't eat that. You know what? Those who are being led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. Be careful about following men. All right? Follow God. Now, God may put a man in your life. God may put a person in your life. God put Paul in Timothy's life. Yes, yes to disciple. But Paul was one who talked about the Berean, the people in Berea, who were more noble-minded than others because they tested everything that Paul said against the Word of God. Mm-hmm. I don't care who you like, who you don't like, test everything you hear against the Word of God. I've said this, I can't, untold times here. I don't ask you to trust me, I ask you to test me. Test what I'm saying against the Word of God. Don't get involved in a religion that's all about Rich. relics and r- yeah. rituals. Don't get re- involved in a religion that just says, okay, here, you know, here you just, don't, you know, just eat the fruit. Get involved in fellowship. In relationship. That, in relationship with Jesus, that builds your relationship with Jesus Christ mm-hmm. and buttresses and is a pillar support and supports the, the truth in your life. Okay, 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer everything created by God is good you know it says in, in, in Proverbs 16 4 that the Lord has made everything for its own purpose mm-hmm. okay the things that God God created the, he, he created right Bereshith. in the beginning God created and he goes, he creates all this, and then he looks and he says, it's good. It's very, very good. good, all right? Yes. Everything that God made was good. Satan cannot create a lie. What you say? He's a liar by nature. He's the father of lies. Yes, he is. But every lie that he tells is a corruption of the truth. Okay? You need to ponder that and think about yes. that. Every lie has has a foundation in truth that's been twisted. Because he can't create anything. He can't create anything, right? And men will follow that corruption. Mm-hmm. In Genesis 6, in the beginning, I mean, in, in verses chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, he said, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Remember, this is the same God, just a few chapters before that, who had said, he looked at it and thought it was good. He saw that it was very good. And now he looks at it and sees that it's corrupt. So led by the, that diabolical demon, it was corrupted by the, the beliefs and actions of men. Right? That's just stay in that place where the word of God is unstained, where it's pure, where you're getting the word. And encourage one another. It says in Hebrews, day by day, as long as it's still called a day, encourage one another. And the best way to encourage one another is with that word that is living and active and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's active for today. It's alive, that word. It didn't wear out 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. The word of God has power in your life to give you life. And then it says in, in 1 Timothy 4, 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Jesus, you know, you, I'm sure you know. I mean, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You want to be nourished? You want to be strengthened? You want to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might? Well, you better be feeding on, feasting on the Word of God. That's what our how our spirit survives. Absolutely. I, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, 
how, how long would you go without food in the natural, right? Mm-hmm. Jeremiah, I love the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, I think, or 16. He says, I word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. That's what we need to get, all right? Mm-hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 14 and 15, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability, and went on his journey. And then he goes on and says, The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Be fruitful. Mm. Is this not the first? I mean, God, what's your, be faithful. Yeah. Be fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply. How do you do that? By cultivating faithfulness. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? How do you become fruitful? By sharing this word. By encouraging others with the word. Spreading. By, by spreading the word of God. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, this is where we're supposed to be. This is what we're supposed to be doing. It goes back to our confession. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be a people of thanksgiving. Not just one day a year, if you're in the United States of America. Every single day and in everything that you do, you're supposed to be giving thanks. That is the will of God. Yes. Well, you know, don't hear it from me. Paul wrote to the, to the Thessalonians in First Thessalonians chapter 5, and he said, Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Want to know God's will for your life? Give thanks. That's that common confession. There are not a lot of people giving thanks. Oh no, you know, they may have something that happens in their life today that makes them, they'll say, oh wow, that's... But there's nobody out there that I know who is, who is unsaved, whose life is a life of thanksgiving. No. Because bad things happen. If you don't believe me, check the news. Don't there's a lot of bad things happening in a lot of places. We're not supposed to be a Red Sea people who no. gave thanks after... After. There's no faith involved there. Give thanks now. Mm-hmm. Because you know that God is in control. Amen. That's supposed to be your confession, all right? And if you have that, you can give thanks no matter what it's like. Because you know okay. that God causes Okay, so I'm not, not going to go on then. I'm just going to give you a homework assignment for the week. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> the homework assign- assignment is to go read about Paul and Silas when they were arrested because Paul had cast a demon out of a, a little girl mm-hmm. and they were thrown oh, okay. into the prison. They were thrown into the deepest, darkest part of the prison. That's, I mean, you can't conceive of how horrible thing that, because there's no equivalent here in, in, in the modern Western world of those Roman, old Roman prisons. Mm. They were taken to the deepest, darkest part of the prison. They were put in a cell and chained to the wall. And yet... What were they doing? They were singing praises to God. They were giving thanks and confessing Him before men. And God shook the earth to set them free. You want God to free you from anything going on in your life? Sing praises to Him. Shout praises to God. Give Him thanks with all your being. And if it takes God to shake the entire earth to fix your situation, He'll do it. And for that, Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your faithfulness. We thank you that you are the one who is true and faithful, Lord God, and that you watch over your word to perform it. Help us, Lord, to be stirred up by your word, to have that confession ready on our lips, Lord God, to proclaim the excellencies of your Son, Christ Jesus, who called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, we just praise you and we do thank you for this time in your word. Hallelujah. Well, until next week, may the Lord God our... May he bless you to bits and shine his glory through your life. Amen. Amen.